surveillance balloon floating over the United States. We don't know what they're looking at. But, um, but you know, it's just, uh, it's just a surveillance balloon. We also have a God who sees everything all around the world, all the time. Knows every thought of our hearts, every action that we take. So uh, we answer to a greater power, don't we? And thank the Lord, you know, He's here. That same God is here in our midst this morning. And that's a, such a wonderful thing to know, that He is here with us. The God of all creation bows down and comes into our presence to uh, build us up, to conform us to His image, and to give us life. Such a wonderful thing to contemplate. Today I want to talk about continuing progress in faith. Continuing progress in faith. We're going to be continuing in the book of Philippians, chapter 1. So last week we saw how Paul viewed the Christians at Philippi as partakers with him in God's grace. He also considered them as partners with him in the work of the gospel. He told them that he held them in his heart and he prayed for their growth in Christ. This morning's reading will reveal uh, Paul's heart to us in three other ways. First, we'll see just how important it was to Paul, the apostle evangelist, that the message of the gospel was being preached, even if it wasn't by him. Second, we'll see the heart of a pastor shepherd as he expresses his selfless desire to see the disciples progress in their faith. And third, we'll see how he urges them to stand firm for the gospel. So these are three traits that are also healthy, traits of a healthy church. The, the gospel being preached by the believers, the believers continuing to grow in their faith, and believers standing firm for the gospel. As we look ahead to Pastor Robert's ministry here at JBC, may we be encouraged by this text today in these three aspects of being the church. So the point, first point I want to make today is that the gospel is preached. Let's read Philippians chapter 1. starting in verse 12. It's on page 1826 in the few Bibles. Mm -hmm. Philippians 1, 12. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brethren in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir of trouble for me while I'm, while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So Paul had learned from Epaphroditus that the Philippian church had heard of his imprisonment in Rome. And because of his close relationship with him, he continues his letter by filling them in on what his situation is at the time. He wants them to know how things are going with him, because that's what friends do. You'll notice, however, that he doesn't concentrate on his own difficulties like we probably would in our letters. In fact, he barely even mentions them. Instead, he wants them to know how God had turned his imprisonment into a catalyst for the preaching of the gospel. That, to him, was the most important thing. That's how he opens this part of the letter. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. How could that be? Paul's sitting in prison. 
guarded day and night as he waits his trial for, for, uh, before Caesar. So you'd think that he would be a very frustrated evangelist with such restrictions. But that is far from the case with Paul. He saw beyond the walls that hemmed him in, and he saw the hand of God that was at work, doing, in spite of, and even because of his imprisonment, the powerful work of the gospel. Each day, there were guards who took their turns watching Paul. They'd come spend the day there with Paul. Was he going to pass up such an opportunity to share the gospel? Absolutely not. In fact, it says in verse 13, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard. Everyone knew, everyone heard, it, all those guards. And to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Well, we don't know if any of those guards came to faith because of what they heard. But there's no doubt that they heard the gospel every time they were with him. If nothing else, it became a topic of conversation within the whole palace guard and even beyond that. Not that Paul would have desired their sympathy. No, that's not what he wanted. He wanted everyone to know that the Christ that he preached and the gospel that he proclaimed was well worth imprisonment and even death. One doesn't risk such dangers for something of no consequence. Paul's message had to do with death and life. Souls dead because of sin were being rescued from that death and receiving eternal life through faith in Christ, the one who gave his life to redeem us from sin. But the impact of Paul's imprisonment was even more far-reaching than the palace guard. Rather than fearing imprisonment themselves because they knew what had happened to Paul, the believers in Rome were emboldened to preach the gospel. Paul's chains, the result of his defense of the gospel, had become a rallying point to spur the believers on to boldly proclaim Christ in their communities. There were those preaching who loved Paul. They knew that he would want the gospel message to continue to be preached, and so they were motivated to support and encourage him in this way in his imprisonment. But there were others who wanted to take advantage of Paul's imprisonment to make themselves look good. With him in prison, there was no fear of competition from this so-called apostle. Because of their envy of him, they desired to cause him even more anguish by his knowing that his rivals were preaching instead of him. Did that bother Paul? Not a bit. Now, you've got to notice that there's no indication here in Philippians that what they were preaching was false doctrine. And so, that being the case, it didn't matter to Paul who was preaching or what their motives were. As long as Jesus, the crucified, resurrected, glorified God-man was being preached, he was content. In fact, he rejoiced because of it. So what can we gain from this text for our situation here at JBC as we anticipate the arrival of our next permanent pastor? And I think there are three points that can be important to us. First, we would expect the gospel will be preached from this pulpit. And I think that we can be confident in that. Second, we would also expect Pastor Roberts to be effective in sharing Christ beyond the walls of this building. And I think we can also be reasonably confident in that. Third, Pastor Roberts mm -hmm. is one man, with the limitations of being one man. The body of Christ, however, is made up of many members. There is no reason why the sharing of the gospel in our community must depend only on our next pastor. Rather, it should be like what Paul described happening in Rome. The many members, that's us, should be involved in sharing the gospel with unbelievers. If we want to see the church grow, this is essential. This passage in Philippians is the clearest example in the New Testament of the average believer, the, the non-ministers, the, the non being involved in evangelism. 
That's not to say that we all need to head to the nearest street corner and start preaching, although the Lord might spur some of us to do that. But how many opportunities come our way daily to share Christ with another person? I believe that we're very good here at JBC in demonstrating the, the love and the grace of Christ, but the truth is that we're not good at speaking the gospel. May this passage in Philippians spur us on to doing that. You may not feel that you can express the gospel message very clearly. If that's the case, all I can say is that one improves through practice. You have to start somewhere. If nothing else, we can all tell others about our experience in Christ and urge them to explore Him for themselves. So the first point of my message today is that the gospel is preached. The second point is that we should be continuing our progress in faith. Let's read on in, first, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. So Paul calls on the Philippians to partner with him in ministry by praying for him, praying for courage, praying for deliverance. But what does Paul mean by deliverance? What does he mean by that? Verse 20 tells us that his desire, even more than being released from the prison, was that Christ would be glorified in his body, as he always did before in the many other difficulties he faced in his apostolic ministry. Paul wanted to have the courage to stand firm for Christ and not be ashamed of him. He knew that could come only through the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and that's what he asked them to pray for. And their prayers for him would ensure that help. He wasn't concerned about whether he lived or died. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that wasn't me. <laughs> he wasn't concerned about whether he lived or died. He just wanted Christ to be glorified in either case, whether he lived or died. Can we say that about ourselves? Can I say that? We've never been at the point in our lives of facing life or death because of our belief in Christ, have we? But if we ever find ourselves in that situation, we trust that by His grace and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus has promised to be there with us. But Paul was in that situation. He makes a statement in verse 21 that's one of the most powerful in the epistles. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live is Christ. Well, what does that mean? It means that the focus of every aspect, every aspect of Paul's life, was Jesus. Everything revolved around and depended upon him. It means that he's the only thing that makes life worth living. Paul stated in another way in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The sole reason for Paul's existence was to know and glorify Christ. 
Later in Philippians chapter 3, he tells of how all that he had once considered to be important in life, he now considered as dumb in the light of knowing Jesus Christ. Can we say that about our own lives? Do we consider knowing Christ as such a treasure that all else pales in comparison? May we come to that place of realizing his great worth and our own insignificance. But Paul's in a life and death situation. Does that cause him fear? No. He finishes his thought in verse 20 by saying, to die is gain. To die is to leave the sufferings of this life behind. To die is to receive the crown of righteousness Paul spoke of in 2 Timothy 4.8. That crown of what, that awaits all who love Christ's appearing. To die is to enter into that blessed hope that Jesus purchased for us by his death and resurrection. To die is to be with the Lord. There is no loss in death for a Christian. It's important that last, last, those last few words, for a Christian. There is no loss in death. There is only gain. That's, all, that's, true, that's what all true believers can, all, can look forward to. Regardless of how good life might be, or how bad, things will be so much better then. As 2 Corinthians 4.17 tells us, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Thank the Lord that we have that earnest expectation, just as Paul did. While well, Paul's in a quandary, should he desire a death sentence so that he can finally be free of striving for the gospel? Or should he be granted release from prison so that he could continue to minister to the, to the believers in Philippi and see them grow to maturity? While there is a hint of uncertainty in his words, he says he's convinced that he will live. And he did. He was released. And he did return to Philippi. He's not only content with that, he, he rejoiced in the thought he knows that his release will enable him to once again visit the Philippians and help them in the progress of their faith. This is the heart of a true pastor shepherd. Our new pastor doesn't have to wrestle with such a decision between life and death, but we can be praying for him as the Philippians prayed for Paul. We can pray that the Spirit of Jesus Christ will be his supply as he leads us. We can pray for courage as he faces the challenge of making a new congregation his home. We can pray that God's grace will be upon him to give him a pastor's heart for us. We can pray for God's anointing upon him so that he can be effective in enabling our progress in the faith. So that we can become the mature body of believers that we need to be. Amen? So, we want to see the gospel preached. We want to see progress in our faith. The third point of today's message is that we should stand firm and contend for the faith. Let's read on in chapter 1, starting in verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So Paul goes on to give some instruction for the Philippians that the church was facing opposition just as Paul had faced it throughout his ministry. Paul's desire for them was that they would walk in a way that was worthy of the gospel and that they would stand firm against opposition. Christ had given his life that they might have life. He had given everything. <coughs> Their only reasonable response, and ours, was to walk as Christ had walked in complete obedience to the Father's will. 
They were to take up their cross and follow him, denying the world and seeking the kingdom of God. That's what we're called to do as well. The Greek word for conduct yourselves has to do with being citizens. The Philippians were citizens of Rome because Philippi was a Roman colony. But their true citizenship was in heaven, where Christ was seated on his throne. So they were to walk in holiness and righteousness, not in the ways of the world in which they lived. They were to walk in the truth and light of the gospel, light of God's word, as Paul had preached it to them. And we are called to walk in that same way as well, to walk in a way worthy of the gospel. Well, whether, whether or not Paul would see them again, if, if he knew they were walking in that way, then he would know that they would stand firm for the gospel. He wanted them to do this in three ways, standing firm in the gospel. First, they would stand firm in one spirit, in one spirit. That, of course, is speaking of the Holy Spirit that indwelt them all and made them one body. As they would be led by that spirit and walk in its power, they would be able to withstand the opposition they face. <coughs> Second, they were to be of one mind, contending as one man, it says. The Greek word for contending here is referring to an athletic competition. They were to act as a team. Everyone was to play their part. They were to be unified as a body of believers, seeking the good of the body above their individual interests. Third, they were to be without fear of their, opponent, uh, of their opponents. These admonitions echo what God said to Joshua and the people of Israel back in the Old Testament. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go and whatever you face. As they do this, their enemies would see the steadfastness of their faith and perhaps realize their own precarious position in the light of eternity. Paul closes this paragraph by reminding them again of their partaking together with him, not just in grace, the grace of God that brought them to faith, but also in the suffering that the children of God will all experience. Are we any different than the Philippians? As time goes on, opposition to the gospel in our country is increasing, and we can be fairly sure that it's going to continue to do so. So as a church, we need to be walking in a way worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a church, we need to be standing firm and contending in unity of spirit and mind for that gospel. As we make this transition to our new pastor, may we be moving forward by entering more fully into these things. May we be that city on a hill that can't be hidden, the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So to wrap this up, our text today challenges us in three ways. First, we should all be preaching the true gospel along with our new pastor. We all have a role to play there. Second, we should be continuing to progress in our faith under the guidance of our new pastor. And third, we should be in unity of spirit and mind as we contend for the faith in the face of the opposition that we will face. Paul rejoiced in all of these things, and he wanted the Philippians to rejoice with him. May we also rejoice as we see God's hand at work in and through our lives in this congregation. May he get all the glory as we move forward in Him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank You for the grace that You have shown to each one of us. Thank You, Lord, the grace that enables us to have faith in Christ and to commit our lives to You. And Lord, as we are your children today, uh, as we are your church, I pray that you would be at work in each one of our hearts, and our minds, our lives, our spirits, to stir us up, Lord, to stir us up, to uh, be willing to share the gospel of Christ with others, to speak of all that you have accomplished for mankind on that cross and through your resurrection. 
that others might come to faith in Christ just as we have, Lord, that we might be able to share that grace with others effectively. And Lord, I pray that we would also continue to grow, make progress in our faith, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might become more and more like you, Lord, and be that light shining in the world that you want us to be. And Lord, I pray especially that as we, uh, as a culture, as a nation, uh, see more and more the opposition of Satan against the, your church. Lord, I pray that you would, by the power of your Spirit, cause us to stand firm in that, to stand for Jesus Christ without wavering, without fear, that others might see uh, you in us, Lord God, and be convicted of their own sin and their own error and come to faith in Christ as well. Lord, I pray that as we enter in this time with the new pastor, that all of these things would be uh, taking place in our lives in the midst of this congregation. Lord, that you might be glorified as, as we make this progress in faith. So we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us, your grace upon us. We thank you for your promises that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will be with us wherever we go. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name.